Welcome to chapter 22, Cultural Conflict, Bubble and Bust. I love that title. This period of time is 1919 to 1932. Basically, guys, the 1920s for the most part, post-World War I, to the onset of the New Deal or Franklin Roosevelt's presidency. So let's get started. So the legacies of World War I are definitely conflicted. First, there's going to be an erosion of labor rights, where the American Federation of Labor will grow during World War I because of the need of industrial production for the war effort, not just to supply the American Expeditionary Force in the United States, but also Britain and the other allies. So labor, remember, the eight-hour workday and overtime was negotiated between the government and the unions to make sure that the industrial production was done. And again, that was for military purposes. At the end of the war, you have three to four million men coming back looking for work. Well, guess what? There was a huge, huge, huge increase in the workforce with not enough jobs um, to fill them. So there was a major problem here. And because of that, companies that are going to transition from a wartime economy to a post-war economy, um, they're not going to have as many orders as they did for the war effort. So they're going to cut wages. That was the way things were back then. If, If business went down, they either lay off or even worse, cut wages. There were no minimum wages or anything like that. So what would happen is workers would go on strike because their wages were being cut and they're asking them to work longer hours for less pay. So Massachusetts Governor Calvin Coolidge won the support for opposing strikes, but that was with the Boston Police Department. Um, it was always understood during this time 1919, 1918, 1919, that public employees should never strike. The whole idea of public employees having having unions won't happen for a very long time, not until the 50s and 60s. So the Boston Police Department force went on strike. And Calvin Coolidge basically said, look, this is, this is a threat to public safety in the capital of Massachusetts, where he re- presided as governor. If you don't get back to work, I'm going to see to it that all of you are fired. And they didn't go back to work. And Calvin Coolidge facilitated the firing of all those police officers. And none of them ever were hired back. Now, the one thing that Calvin Coolidge did do, though, he did help some of these officers, former officers, find jobs in state government and other ways. It's not like he walked away from them like, haha. But he did set the point that you should not strike on public safety. And what that's going to do, it's going to catapult Governor Coolidge to become a um, hero in the Republican Party. So opposing strikes, again, if you look at the Boston Post uh, newspaper in the bottom, police vote to strike tonight, walk out of 545. Coolidge went back and forth because the governor had a lot of power over the city of Boston back then. Because if the police would strike, then the governor would have to bring in the National Guard of the militia that would keep order within a city. Also, there were laws in Massachusetts at the time that the legislature had control over the city of Boston, basically because it was run by the Irish, and the non-Irish that ran the legislature didn't trust them, so they passed all these laws to oversee the city, which we look at it today, it's pretty messed up. But that was the overall um, relationship then. Some companies, notably Ford uh, Motor Company, practiced welfare capitalism during the booming economic times of the 1920s. What that meant is, is that they, the company, would take care of families' needs in order, you know, when they worked with the company. In other words, there were certain things that the company would do um, for the welfare of, of, of the family, such as health insurance, um, such as um, 
life insurance and taking care of uh, families if something happened to those that work for the company. Okay, but that's good during booming economic times. They would do that instead of raising wages and that kind of stuff. But during tough economic times, um, we'll see if that kind of stuff gets offered or even the promises get fulfilled. The Red Scare. So first, which caused conflict is we looked in the last chapter, this mass movement of African Americans from the south to the northern cities. That was to take jobs, um, the, the need for industrial jobs to be filled in the north. In that red summer of 1919, there were race riots in many northern cities. Um, 120 died in these race riots by September 1919. And blacks competed with northern whites for jobs and housing. In the South, lynching rose from 1917 to 1919. So you had basically 400,000 African Americans that fought in the military in World War I in segregated units, weren't even allowed to celebrate in Paris, as we looked at in the last chapter. They come back home, and things are just as bad, if not worse, in the South with lynching. And things are really tough. Um, for African Americans that moved up to the cities when um, the white soldiers came home looking for jobs. I will say this again. Usually when you see an increase in lynchings in the South or racial strife in the North, it's when economic times are tough. After World War I, the United States economy had to transform itself from a war economy to a peacetime economy. That means a consumer economy. It's not going to be easy. Add to it four million new people looking for jobs. Say three, three and a half million looking for jobs at the same time. It was tough. And unfortunately, we see the ugliness come out of people when they're desperate. And that's when racial hatreds, um, ethnic hatreds, and that kind of stuff, or ethnic problems, start to come out of people. Um, it's ugly, but it's reality. And usually what correlates to it is economic fears, fears for their job, fear for paying their bills, fears for their families. Unions were often associated with radicalism and socialism. Okay? So, unions, any kind of strife, any type of disorder in a society... What happened after World War One? people would start pointing to socialism, radicalism, and then when it comes to this whole Red Scare idea, communism. Many new immigrants had socialist views. Why? Socialism said, look, you're going to work hard, you're going to be put where you need to work, and you're going to have a fair shake like everyone else. Capitalism to them seems unfair. And if you're an immigrant and you're on the out, you're not, you know, on the in crowd, in a capitalist society, you could be shut out of the free market just because of your ethnicity or potentially your race. That's always a potential thing in a free market. So the socialist views, they saw, hey, government power and other things would make things fair for everyone. So just understand why an immigrant may have socialist views. Also understand many of these immigrants came from socialist economies and socialist countries in Europe. The birthplace of socialism is in 19th century Europe as we talked about, that came here and influenced the progressive era. Or the progressives, not the era. The progressives themselves, which became known as the progressive era. The Bolshevik revolution in Russia frightened many Americans. The Bolsheviks were extreme socialists that wanted government ownership of the economy, which we today call communism, that that followed the writings of the 19th century philosopher Karl Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto. A. Mitchell Palmer was the um, Attorney General of the United States. In this first Red Scare, after a bomb explosion at his house, Palmer cracked down on radical organizations. This is known as the Palmer Raids, where over 6,000 people were arrested suspicion of being communist, reds, anarchists, radicals, and that kind of stuff. Um, and what agency is born in the Palmer Raids is the Federal Bureau of Investigation, 
which is created to investigate these people and these types of things to look for subversion and to look at these radical organizations and arrest these people and get them out of uh, American society. Now we come to the infamous Sacco and Benzetti trial in Aftermath. They are two Italian immigrants who were accused of murder. Eventually, they were sentenced to death in 1927. Were they guilty? Were they innocent? It's still heavily debated today, although most agree they did not get a fair trial because they were Italian immigrants and the prosecution said, well, they must be guilty because they were probably anarchists. Well, I don't know if they get you to get involved in a rob, uh, rob, I mean, uh, armed robbery and murder someone. We'll look at Taco and Benzetti a little bit more in class for sure. We'll look at the case. Um, we'll look at what happened and we'll discuss it. Well, so we have the 1920s. This era is called for President or then Candidate Harding called for a return to normalcy. What is that? Limited government as opposed to the progressive era. And staying out of European affairs. That's the rejection of the Treaty of Versailles. That's basically what this normalcy thing is. This is going to be the 1920s. Republican ideals for the most part. Limit government. Lower taxes. Less spending. Less regulation. Stay out of European affairs. Anti-Wilsonianism. Rejection of that Treaty of Versailles. The League of Nations. And that engagement with the world on that scale. To say that the 1920s Republicans were isolationists, I think, is a little too elementary. We'll look at that. There's some very important agreements um, on the international stage that did happen during the 1920s that could refute that the Republicans were isolationists. Women in politics, you have the Shepherd Tarney Federal uh, Maternity and Infancy Act. Um, was uh, provided federal funds for education programs and clinics. This is one of the first pieces of federal legislation that gave some sort of federal funds for people. Usually this was just a state function. It did help improve health care for the poor. It's the first time Congress allotted money to states for social welfare programs. And what they would do is they allot money for states and have the states administer it. This model will be used for Medicaid. This will be used for educational funds. Many ways how the federal government pays for um, types of programs for individuals is what they call block grants or block money sent to states. Then the states will determine how to administer it with minimum requirements. And the states have the option to add on to that if they choose to. That's the Medicaid model. There's a certain amount of money the federal government gives towards Medicaid. Then a state can decide to do more or less. Like Massachusetts is pretty generous with its mass health program. They take the federal requirement of Medicaid. And Massachusetts over the years has expanded mass health much more than the requirement of Medicaid. Um, that's probably why it's over 40% of our state budget. That's another discussion, so we'll move on from there theme during the 1930s forward will be Congress allotting money to states for social welfare programs. Just understand that the seed for this was planted when Harding was president in the early 20s. Okay? So keep that in mind. Also, the Equal Rights Amendment will be introduced then. It won't be finally disposed of until the 1970s. It was proposed by Alice Paul in the 1920s. There she is on the right. It was not ratified by Congress until the 1970s, 50 years later, and then it failed to get the three-quarters ratification from the states. I think it was short by two, maybe even one. It was pretty close. There were women that came out against it saying, look, you can't put negative rights in the Constitution. Um, the way it was written, they didn't think it was was fair overall or something of that sort. Then you have the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, led by Jane Addams and others, that criticized imperialism, 
imperialism and militarism. Okay? Imperialism was unfair to those from those countries. They should have that self-determination that Woodrow Wilson um, talked about in his 14 points and tried to um, put into the Treaty of Versailles. And against militarism. That militarism is just going to lead to more wars. Um, we should be cutting down on the size of our militaries. And if you don't have it, you won't use it. So that was the idea of this Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Republicans in business. Harding will win the presidency in 1920 in a landslide. He appoints Herbert Hoover, who was uh, at the head of the Food Administration, the most popular politician in America, I guess, outside of Harding, okay, as Commerce Secretary. That Commerce means business. Secretary of Commerce is business and business relations. And Hoover believed in what this idea of the associated state where there was cooperation between the government and business leaders to achieve economic stability. And that model is pretty much still there now for the most part. On differing degrees depending on the president and depending on how they think how heavy a hand government should or shouldn't have in the economy. But what's going to define Harding's presidency is the teapot. Teapot Dome scandal. There's Teapot Dome right there on the right, the area there. Secretary of Interior Albert Fall leased government land to private companies in exchange for $300,000 in bribes. Today, that's like $2 million. <clears throat> Albert Fall was the Fall guy. How many of you heard that term? The Fall guy. He took blame for all of it, that all the money went to him. $2 million bucks. That he took all of it? I highly, highly, highly doubt it. There were other guys or girls getting money out of this. Probably members of Congress. Other people in the in the Harding administration. Okay? And this area, Teapot Dome, had oil. Okay? You'd be able to drill for oil and other things. So, that was basically the epitome of the Harding administration. Except for his vice president, who's going to become president, by the way, Calvin Coolidge. There were some really dirty characters. They called his cabinet, the Ohio, his unofficial cabinet, the Ohio Gang. Um, they were not the most, let's just say, um, trustworthy people to be put into public trust. Well, Harding, Warren Harding, is going to have a massive, massive heart attack in a hotel room in San Francisco when he's on the road. Previous to that, it was known that he probably wasn't in the best cardiac shape, but he kept going. He insisted on keeping on going. Well, he ended up dying on the road. Calvin Coolidge was up in Vermont at his father's house. Calvin Coolidge grew up in Vermont, in a place called Plymouth, Vermont. The home he grew up still stands. It still to this day does not have electricity in it. The, the photo there is him at his house being sworn in by his dad, who was a justice of the peace for president when they learned that uh, President Harding died. It was reverse here. Grew up in Vermont, but went to school at Amherst College in Amherst. Settled in Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, st studied un under a lawyer to become a lawyer. You didn't have to go to law school back then. It's probably the way it should be now. If any of you have family members that teach at law schools, no offense. Um, and he stayed in Northampton. Uh, so he was elected to the school committee. He was elected an alderman or city councilor. I, I don't know if he was elected mayor. Maybe mayor. If not, he might have lost that. He was elected state representative, then state senator, then lieutenant governor, then governor of Massachusetts, then vice president and president, all in the sk span, I think, of 24 years. That sounds about right to me, about 24 years. Not that long of a time. He's kind of like the forgotten Massachusetts president. We talk about Massachusetts presidents. It's like, oh, yeah, John F. Kennedy and John Adams. But, hey, what about Calvin Coolidge? So, um, but he was up in Plymouth Vermont visiting his dad when they got the call to a phone at the store down the street that his father owned or used to own and uh, that the president had died. 
And so that evening, it was around 2.30 in the morning, I think it was, or something, his father, who was a justice of the peace, swore him in as president of the United States. He, Calvin Coolidge, and Secretary of the Treasury, Andrew Mellon, who's on the right there, advocated tax cuts for businesses. Now, let's talk about this for a second. If you cut federal taxes, do revenues increase or decrease? Because a lot of people might think, well, you know, if you cut taxes, you know, how are you going to pay for that? Revenue is going to decrease. Well, Coolidge and Mellon understood, well, more so Mellon. Coolidge, you know, spoke with them and then agreed with them, and they worked together on this, that if you cut federal taxes in the right areas, revenue for the government will increase. And that's exactly what's going to happen in the 1920s. The type of tax cuts that they did, that means the cut of rates, tax rates, your top rate, your middle rate, your lower rates, your tax rates on certain aspects of business were cut in a series of cuts in different times and waves and were monitored with the goal of spurring economic growth, which in turn would increase governmental revenues. At the same time, Coolidge worked with a former, I think a former um, colonel. He met a couple times a week. I forgot his name. And they sat there and found ways they could trim the federal budget at the same time. So tax cuts plus spending cuts almost wiped out the cost in the, from the recession and the cost of World War I and brought the national debt down to under a billion dollars while Coolidge was president, up until about 1924-25. The reason I'm saying this, they were able to do that. They were able to cut taxes that increased revenue because it was done in a strategic way. And at the same time, they were able to cut spending at the federal level. And it worked. But here's the kicker, guys. There were barely any social welfare programs at the time. There were no entitlements. There was no welfare. There was no Social Security. There was no Medicare. There wasn't a Veterans Administration. There wasn't all the kinds of things we have today. Unemployment benefits. It's very hard to do that today. So, just so you understand, that was Mellon's plan. Targeted tax cuts that increase governmental revenue. Then Coolidge on his side would find work and you have savings. It came down to what he served for food in the White House. Because the president's salary paid for state dinners back then. He changed dinners from these fancy French cuisines to bologna sandwiches and meatloaf dinners to save money. And he would sit there himself and do it. Now, mind you, the White House staff loved the guy because he was very hands-on. He went and made his own food down there. You're talking about, if you want to think about a cheap Yankee, somebody that took care of himself and was very frugal, this was Calvin Coolidge. Calvin Coolidge didn't own a house until after he was president. He and his wife always rented a half of a house in Northampton their whole life. He didn't buy a house, and he bought it out of necessity because everybody wanted to go see the former president. He bought it after he was president. And tragically, he died young. He died of heart failure before he was 60 years old. He died just before Franklin Roosevelt was inaugurated in 1933. But I know a lot about Coolidge because I was always curious. Well, what about the other Massachusetts president of the 20th century? And it was Calvin Coolidge. And it was during the 1920s. He did a lot of important things. You might not agree with what he did. But a lot of the things he did still stand today, like tax cuts, increasing revenue. It worked under John F. Kennedy and his tax cuts of 1962. It also worked under Ronald Reagan, under his tax cuts of 1981. They're saying now that the Trump tax cuts of, of 2017 are going, are, looks like a revenue uptick. But here's the kicker. The difference is Coolidge was able to cut spending. The other guys, Kennedy and his successor Johnson, oops, Vietnam War, no cut in spending. Ronald Reagan, he had a Democratic Congress that didn't want to stop uh, spending. Plus, he had to rebuild the military, no cut in spending. Trump, I haven't seen any cut in spending yet either. So there's the difference. I know I'm going on about this, but I want you to see the trajectory of this way of thinking. It goes back to Mellon. You call it Mellonomics, and it's under uh, Kennedy. And then they call it Reaganomics in the 80s, and I don't know what they're calling it now. 
So dollar diplomacy, we discussed this in theory. Um, we looked at the Roosevelt Corollary. It began under Taft's administration where it advocated U.S. banks providing loans to foreign countries so that there, there was a financial interest. And in some cases, the U.S. military would intervene to ensure the repayment of loans. So, yeah, you don't want the banks, American banks, being put on the hook. So if they loan the money, sometimes they would have the U.S. Army come in or the Marines and collect their loans or their debts would be their sheriffs. Kind of pretty heady stuff there. Oh, you don't pay? We're going to send the U.S. Marines. Yeah, they probably will cough it up. So from in Nicaragua from 1912 to 1933, the United States would go in and out occupying Nicaragua under this whole dollar diplomacy idea. Also the Dominican Republic from 1916 to 1924. The same thing. In and out of there of loans and things of that sort. And then from in Haiti... From 1915 to 1934. I don't know if you've been to Haiti. I haven't, but I've heard heartbreaking stories about Haiti. Haiti's just a mess. Um, Dominican Republic, decent. I've been there a few, uh, a couple times on vacation. Um, never been to Nicaragua. That's been kind of, eh. So. Culture wars in the 1920s. First is prohibition. Is the 18th Amendment... It passed in part due to anti-German sentiments during World War I. German beer. Yeah. The law was often broken. Speakeasies are not adequately enforced. Also, it goes back to the temperance movement, guys. Where the refrain from the use of alcohol, that alcohol was a real problem with a lot of families where men would, you know blow their paycheck in the saloon on the weekends and go home and abuse their families and beat their wives and all these different horror stories. Prohibition was able to pass once the progressive income tax was passed because then government, the federal government, wasn't relying upon the excise taxes. Okay, The law was there, but it was broken routinely. It was not adequately enforced. A lot of police looked the other way. A lot of police were paid off. Cops didn't get paid much back then. I'm not going at cops because I could see it. You're paid as a cop. You're not making a lot of money. You have the lure of all this money. There's all this money from illegal uh, speakeasies and stuff. You just look the other way. It's not right, but it happened. And certain areas, they just didn't enforce it. Like, yeah, whatever. Because of this, organized crime is going to grow in the United States and get a foothold. Speakeasies, they call rum running or whatever you want to call it, moonshining, whatever it is, is going to get organized crime really going. Also, an evolution in the schools. The Scopes Monkey Trial was a conflict between science and religious fundamentalism. Scopes was supported by the ACLU and defended by Clarence Darrow. Okay, um, and supporting the state of Tennessee was former presidential candidate William Jennings Bryan. So what's the conflict? Do you teach evolution in schools? Right from the Bible. Or do you, not evolution, the original, you know, the, the create, creation story in schools. I'm sorry, evolutions with Darwin. Why am I even saying that? The evolution of human beings, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. Or do you teach creationism? Do you create? Do you teach the story that Genesis and the Christian uh, Western Bible describes as the beginning of mankind? Well, in Tennessee was a law that said that's what you teach. You teach what the Bible says, not what some scientist said in his theory, which is Charles Darwin. Well. Scopes was encouraged by the ACLU to violate that law in order to have this trial. And it did happen in Tennessee in a small town. Some people believe it was done on purpose because the town needed business and money. I don't know about that. Um, but um, that was actually said to me by one of our students that came from another school district. Maybe that's the case. It was a big deal. The trial... Um, was recorded on the radio and transcripts of it were in the newspapers throughout the country. Um, the scopes lost. You had to pay a little fine and couldn't do it anymore. And because of that, our science curriculum in the United States was basically decimated until the 1950s, until Sputnik, when, oh no, the Soviets have a satellite and we don't, they're ahead of us in science. Well, 
yeah, if you reject the fundamentals of science, you're probably going to be behind on it. So this is my two cents, nothing political, uh, just an observation. So this call to wars, you're not supposed to drink, you're supposed to teach the Bible's account of creation of the human race. Uh, and other people are like, yeah, what about science there? So this whole conflict between faith and reason. Also, nativism in the 1920s. Again, surprise, surprise, early in the 1920s as the economy was turning around, what you're going to have when the economy is rough and it's taken a while to come back, people are going to blame others for their problems. The new immigrants coming in were often Catholic and Jewish from Southern and Eastern Europe. There was also a gentleman's agreement at the turn of the century with Teddy Roosevelt. Japan agreed to limit Japanese immigration. In 1921, there was the Emergency Quota Act that restricted European immigration. The book will make it look like that people didn't want Europeans in the country. Some didn't. But let's look at some numbers. World War I, after World War I, most of Europe was a disaster. So many countries that were countries were no longer countries. There was a lot of confusion, misplacement. A lot of these countries are going to totalitarianism, extreme socialism, like Germany eventually will become Nazi. Italy will become fascist. Russia became communist. There was a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of pain and suffering in Europe. So a lot of Europeans wanted to escape that. So they looked to the United States. Well, look to the United States. After World War I, you had to transform in, starting in 1919 from a wartime economy to an overall um, consumer industrial economy add to the equation we have 4 million new, more people that want to go to work that's a problem there aren't enough jobs there's huge deficits in the government there's huge amounts of unemployment there's labor strife and strikes okay the emergency court act was passed on emergency saying look guys we need to stop the European immigration and let us get our country under control we don't have the economic need for workers the history of American immigration was the history of when there was need for folks to be able to contribute to the economy. Most countries, that's what they based their immigration on. It was determined at that time that where most of the people were running to America to escape Europe, were from Europe, they're escaping Europe. The Congress, nor the new President Harding, believed they could absorb all of this immigration when we're in the midst of a massive recession, post-World War I. That's the reason for the Emergency Quota Act. Notice it's only European immigration. Immigration from the borders, from Canada and Mexico, were never, ever, ever touched. The National Origins Act of 1924 restricted European immigration even further. What influenced that more than anything else guys was the red scare the fear of communism and all of these other socialist ideologies remember Sacco and Benzetti I'm not saying it's right but understand that was the reason for it they saw a lot of problems coming from war, post World War Europe but notice they only restricted European immigration they did not restrict immigration from Mexico the Americas or Canada okay because they looked at Europe as where the massive amounts of people would come. And they believed still in 1924 the economy could not absorb it. The economy was just starting to boom. 1923 into 24. Okay. So maybe late 22. But it takes a while. It's starting to boom. So there was the calculation. They didn't want that to mess up. The other calculation is, is that they didn't want some of these socialists and communists and all this other stuff coming into the country. It was a fear, maybe not a legitimate fear, but it was a real fear. So I just want you to keep that in mind because sometimes when you read textbooks, they'll say that these restricted immigration acts were somehow racist or ethnically um, charged. Maybe some of it, but it's more about numbers, the economy, 
and political concerns because Europe was still a mess. Europe was still a mess in the 1920s, absolutely for sure. Um, you had some really scary things happening, um, particularly in Italy. Um, you have you can have civil wars. You have all kinds of stuff going on in Europe. A lot of displacement. And people saw that if you let that immigration come in, you're going to be bringing that chaos and confusion into the United States that's still trying to recover um, its economy and transition its economy from the First World War. Again, just there were no restrictions on immigrants from Latin America or North Canada. Not many people from Canada was coming to the United States. Some French Canadians. Okay, so I just want you to put that in perspective because today... In politics, people will try to say, oh, you know, our immigration laws were racist. They are now, and this, that, and everything else. The history of immigration in the United States is can we absorb the numbers? There's an argument right now. Can we absorb not only the illegal immigration that's been coming to the United States, can we absorb legal immigration? You could fall on either side or whatever side of that, but it's usually about what's best for the country, should be, I guess, and what's best for the economy. If you look at different times in history, the United States has slowed down immigration at certain times. They would have a pause. This was the 1920s. But this pause is going to go for a while, guys. Why? The Great Depression is going to hit. There's going to be no appetite to open up the borders then, right? Because people fear for jobs. Then you got World War II. Guess what? You're at war with a lot of these people that were coming from Europe. Okay? The 1950s was a rebuilding then you're going to see change in immigration in the 1960s. Okay? So, I know I'm putting going way out there, um, further out in history, but I just want you to be cognizant of that. And there were, if you read some of this stuff, some of the debate on this, you're going to see there's a lot of different perspectives that is always put in the textbooks. So, here's the immigration. From... 1881 to 1890, most of your immigration came from North and Western Europe. As the turn of the century came, a little bit more, and as you know, came from South and Eastern Europe, the 1901 to 1910 was more than three quarters. Then it started to tick back, where most of your immigration from Europe came from Northern and Western Europe. This is trying to show that, you know, you look at Southern Europe in particular, that these people didn't t tend to be, I guess, as pearly white as those from North and Western Europe. That may be the case. Um, there were other things going on during the 20s and the 30s that had a lot to do with that. Um, what textbooks are going to try to say is that people wanted to shut out Catholics and Jews. Maybe some people wanted to do that. But if you look at Southern and Eastern Europe, that's where your major problems were with these countries and political strife. I mean, uh, the anarchy in Eastern Europe is what helped start World War I, okay? In that area, Bosnia, um, Yugoslavia, in that area, okay? I'm, just, I'm not defending anybody, I'm just putting other perspectives. Southern Europe had a lot of displacement in Spain and Portugal. Also, in Italy in particular, the rise of fascism and Benito Mussolini. So, just wanted, you know, keep that in perspective. The national clan is going to reemerge. Again, tough economic times, tough political times. The clan and hate groups and stuff will emerge. The birth of a nation in 1915 glorified the KKK and it's resurged in the 1920s. As I said, Woodrow Wilson had a screening of this film in the White House. One of the reasons I don't like Woodrow Wilson. It has nothing to do with his politics. Yeah, he made mistakes. He did some good things. But guess what? The guy was a hardcore racist. I'm all set. In addition to targeting blacks, the new Klan targeted Catholics, Jews, and immigrants or non-wasps. Okay. Let's back up. Before the election of 1928, they basically, oops, sorry about that. They basically controlled the 1924 Democratic National Convention in New Jersey, known as the Klan Bake. 
not a clam bake, the clan bake. They did not want an anti-lynching statement put into the Democratic Party platform. So they basically controlled that convention to make sure it didn't happen. The Klan, in its history, has always been part of, and I'm not, don't take this wrong way, but it's been part of the Democratic Party apparatus then. So when they were concerned about anti-lynching, here they come to make sure it doesn't go on the Democratic Party platform. The Democrats had a lot of problems since Reconstruction and going all the way up into the 20s and 30s and problems with uh, the Klan, okay? So they're going to become very powerful in the 20s and then as the economy gets better and stuff, they're going to disappear again. The election of 1928, the Democrats nominated Governor Al Smith the first Catholic presidential nominee. Some of you would say, well, if you look in the past, a last bullet point that they targeted, the Klan targeted blacks, Jews, and Catholics, and all that. This was a bitter nomination fight, and by 1928, the Klan is starting to kind of go back into the shadows again because the economy's really good. There's not concerns about, you know, African Americans threatening the electorate, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Al Smith is the governor of New York. It's going to be a pretty t tough nomination fight. He's going to win it. The thing is, some people say the Democrats let him have the nomination at the convention because they knew he was going to get killed, that he was going to lose to Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover at the time in 1928 was the most popular politician in America. If you had approval ratings, he would be the most popular in the country at the time. No one was beaten. Herbert Hoover. Calvin Coolidge decided very early in his second term he was not going to run for another term. 1927, I have it the t-shirt. I do not choose to run. He wrote it on small pieces of paper, gave it to the press, smiled, and went back in the White House. He didn't talk about it. In the 1924 election, Calvin Coolidge lost his, his uh, second son, Calvin Jr. He got a, uh, an infection in his toe while playing tennis, and he died from it, his teenage son. He was never the same. Um, he finished, got reelected, but his heart was not in it after him. Don't get me wrong. He didn't pack it in. He worked hard in the second term. But Calvin Coolidge losing his son, Calvin Jr., really, really took the heart out of Calvin Coolidge, literally. Um, it broke his heart, broke his wife's heart, Grace. Um, so very early on, after the reelection, he said, I'm not running. So that set up Herbert Hoover. Smith was not going to beat him. A lot of people believe, ah, put the Catholic up, he's the sacrificial lamb. I'm not sure if that's the case, but that's what happened. And now Smith got smoked. As I said, the Republicans nominated Herbert Hoover, who won overwhelmingly. So intellectual modernism. Harlem was in vogue with jazz music. It began in New Orleans. And then it seeped into Chicago, and more so in New York and Harlem. Louis Armstrong was on the bottom right, helped spread jazz when he moved to Chicago from New Orleans, Louisiana. Jazz music is a black music form. Just like rhythm and blues, just like even country music comes from more so African American uh, musical forms. Duke Ellington, who's on the left there on the piano, was a prominent jazz player in Harlem. You can listen to their recordings, some of their original recordings, or other um, musicians later on playing um, some of their more famous works. Marcus Garvey. In the UNIA, the United Negro Improvement Association advocated black separatism. These ideas will be influential in the 1960s civil rights movement with someone like uh, Malcolm X. So before we looked at um, Du Bois, who was more about intellectualism, going to school, getting advanced degrees, that's going to advance African Americans. You had Booker T. Washington, who believed that uh, learning trade or learning um, having a vocation will help with black equality. Well, Garvey wasn't very optimistic. He's like, man, 
I think you got to separate. Um, you got to separate in your community um, from from the white community because the whites are never ever going to accept you as equals. It promoted um, a back to Africa movement, which was you know separatist again. And then Pan Africanism, they hope to unite all individuals of African descent. So Garvey believed the only way African Americans are going to have their true freedom and liberation is to separate from white society. Um, Martin Luther King is going to reject that, and most of the civil rights leaders of the 50s and 60s will, will reject that. But there's still some today that believe that separatism in communities and stuff is better for, for um, African Americans. So, I mean, everybody's in, entitled to their opinions and, 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 the, and their way of life. Uh, I tend to think differently, but that's easier for me as a white guy to say that. So, I'll leave it there. So, critiquing American life, you have the lost generation. They're writers of the 1920s that criticize consumerism in American culture. Similar to the beat generation that we'll look at in the 1950s. A lot of these writers went to Europe to get away from the United States. They're very critical of that consumerism that people will lose in their ways, their morals, what is right, what is wrong, all for the almighty dollar. That the American way creates people to be fake because of consumerism and wanting to flash how rich they are or whatever it is. It shows uh, people uh, to be fake. Examples, Hemingway's A Farewell to Arms, St. Kitt. Sinclair Lewis's Babbitt and F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. The Great Gatsby tends to be more famous of many of them. And that is, again, going to that whole fakeness of the rich and the powerful and putting forth the perception of having that, that type of uh, clout. The post-war economy, you had rampant inflation in 1919 that we talked about where many big businesses emerged to survive. Farmers were left out of much of the economic prosperity of the 1920s, and competition from European farmers drove the price of crops down. Okay, so post World War One were terrible for farmers. Big businesses had to merge in order to survive. They would, they would uh, diversify. A lot of these corporations will diversify in different kinds of products to be able to to keep up. Farmers would produce more in the hopes of making money, but it helped. But it helped reduce prices of goods overall. Some of these problems that the farmers had in the 19th century are repeating itself in the 1920s. More and more money is going to this industrial boom, the automobile and other things. Um, no need to send food to Europe. You have Europeans farming now. So the farmers are getting crushed again. Here's some of the uh, consumer goods. Vacuum cleaners, refrigerators, uh, typewriters, right? You see that there? Advertising industry began to sell hope. Hope that you can have these things and have an easier life. Goods were purchased more in credit. You buy now, pay later. There's Model T, automobile, one car for every six Americans. Highway construction increased drastically. Hotels, restaurants, and gas stations will increase. All these would be necessary for those on the move. You didn't have a lot of hotels and restaurants, obviously gas stations. Hotels, restaurants, and gas stations were created and were created for the life of the automobile. Railroads were hurt big time. More Americans traveled by car and vacation. A third of Americans by 1929. Before that, it was by rail. So the railroads are going to get crushed by the automobile. Consumer culture in Hollywood, Southern California provided land, good weather, and a nice scenery. This whole vision of the flapper, more of an image than a reality. You see to the right, that would be a flapper. Shorter dresses and short hair. Before that, Victorian were very, very long dresses with layers and layers and layers. And super, super, super long hair that was tied up. Or put up. And these women, they smoked, they danced, they drank. Huh? So that was a big, 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 big change. 
So the coming of the Great Depression, more Americans bought stock in the 1920s. And how they bought stock is they bought on margin. You put a little money down to purchase a stock, sometimes 5 to 20%. So if a stock's worth 100 bucks, you put down 20 bucks, you borrow the rest. The idea was is that that stock is just going to multiply, multiply. You'll easily pay it off and still make money. Well, that works when the stock market's going up. It does not work when it starts to go down. The stock market will go down pretty big on October of 1929. Farming, construction, and industries saw the production indoor prices plummet. When it crashed, it didn't. It started roller coastering up and down, but it was not sustainable. Unemployment will soon reach 25 percent. Banks will close. Back then, when the bank closed, you lost your money. Savings were not guaranteed. Charities had a difficult time keeping pace with those in need. They couldn't keep up. So many people were in need. They only had so much money and so much manpower, like, no offense, ladies, or people, volunteers, to help those in need. Well, their volunteers became the people in need. So, quick recap. The Red Summer and the Red Scare, racial strife, fear of uh, anarchy, communism, socialism, okay? You're coming back from war. You don't have a job. Things have changed drastically. The economy is in massive inflation. You're trying to transition over. Blame the people that don't look like you. Blame the people that are not American. Make sense? Not that it's right. Return to normalcy. What does normalcy mean? Limited government, not progressive government. Staying out of foreign affairs. In other words, not... Um, Staying out of European affairs. Okay, it's not necessarily isolationism, but none of this Wilson League of Nations Treaty of Versailles stuff. The Equal Rights Amendment was born in the 20s, was not ratified by Congress to the 70s, and failed in the late 70s to be ratified for the Constitution. Excuse me, proposed by Congress, ratified. The Teapot Dome scandal defined the the um, Harding presidency with the corruption of 300,000. Today would be 2 million to Albert Fall. The Fall guy said it all went to him. Yeah, doubt it. Dollar diplomacy under Taft, and that would become the diplomacy of the 1920s where the U.S. military will intervene in order to protect economic interest and loans given by banks to countries like Nicaragua, the Dominican Republic, and Haiti. The Natural Origins Act of 1924, the second of two acts. Again, I discussed other reasons why Congress wanted to do this. They wanted to stop the flow of immigration because they believed they couldn't absorb it first for economic reasons. The second time in 1924, not just for economic reasons, but for political reasons. They were afraid of what the strife that was going on in Europe would spill over into the United States. Maybe not a legitimate fear, but it was. The Harlem Renaissance. An explosion of art, literature, poetry, and music. I just scratched the surface with the music, but Langston Hughes, the poet. Um, we'll go a little bit more to the Harlem Renaissance stuff in class. Okay? Unbelievable stuff. Marcus Garvey, another civil rights um, leader. This individual was a separatist, believed in black separatism. It's the only way you're going to become free and liberated that whites will never, ever, ever, ever um, condone civil rights for all. Big break from W.E.B. Du Bois, who talked about being edu highly educated, becoming integrated over time, or Booker T. Washington uh, through um, vocation and bringing a trade to the table. The lost generation of people that had a real problem with American consumerism and capitalism thought that uh, the human condition was being um, turned into some fake kind of thing over consumerism and over um, the, the desire to be rich and powerful or perceivably powerful. The impacts of the automobile and the economy and on culture. Hotels, restaurants, gas stations, that kind of stuff. New businesses, new economy, new way of thinking. Go on vacation in a car. So if you have any questions, again, don't, when we go to the 1920s, please act. I only scratched the surface. I didn't even get into baseball and sports and leisure. We'll get into some of that stuff. We'll look at more of that as we go along.
So if you have any questions, please ask them. And I look forward to spending some more time on the 1920s. So for now, thank you and until next time.